Hi, I'm Ryan, and today we're going to build a miniature version of a two-player arcade with a Raspberry Pi. Construction of this arcade is pretty similar to my other miniature arcade builds. I've already designed the outer frame, borrowing a layout very similar to the rest of my kits, except this control panel supports two players. The two-player setup isn't for anyone. You'll be rubbing elbows with strangers in a literal manner, so just keep that in mind. Assembly of this cabinet is the same. Glue everything together except the rear and the control panel. Later in this assembly, I'm going to try and focus on configuring RetroPie for two players via the Raspberry Pi GPIO pins. I also want to talk about a simple way to wire the cabinet all together, but we'll get there. I have a number of arcade build tutorials. To keep things from getting stale, I'm going to gloss over some things that I've already discussed in detail from previous videos, like building the cabinet frame. I've already sanded, primed, painted, and made vinyl graphics for this cabinet. What I have not talked about in detail before is how I make these graphics. The graphics you see here were done in CAD, Inkscape specifically, with a few big hurdles done in CorelDRAW. There's no secret really, I pull up some Google images of Neo Geo cabinets and redraw all the graphical elements I want as vector graphics. This means for any arcade build of any shape, size, or ratio, I can rescale my vectors so they appear correct. They're not stretched or squished if they were bitmap graphics. I am pretty comfortable with Inkscape, but there's no shortcut to learning a CAD program if you need to draw something. If you do need to make your own graphics and want to skip as much of the manual bitmap tracing, try this website. It's a good launchpad for some popular arcade themes with the most common features traced into vector formats. If you still need to make graphics from bitmaps, I recommend getting your hands on Corel Draw. The trace bitmap tool is substantially better than the similar tool built in Inkscape. However, Inkscape is free, so you do get what you pay for. And Inkscape also absolutely does not function when I run my screen capture tool. So that's why you're seeing my expired trial of Corel Draw. Look, vectorized graphics are the only way to go. If you've got vector graphics, you can fix some common errors like this. Uh, Mario having a blue hat in the first Mario Brothers arcade game. That looks dumb, so I'm going to destroy the original integrity of this work by making his hat red. Luigi also looks totally weird, so we'll give him a fix too. If you're more of a Waluigi fan, you can do that as well. The point is, after 8 hours of painstakingly fixing bitmap traces, you've earned the right to modernize color choices that you see fit for your arcade build and use these graphics for any arcade size ratio that you see fit. Once you've got those graphics looking swell, I recommend printing on an inkjet printer with high gloss, heavyweight photo paper. You can get this done at print services or places that do printing, just make sure you print without scaling. A few months ago, I made this PCB to simplify wiring a mini arcade. I've built a few hundred miniature arcade machines, and a wiring solution was well overdue. I call this PCB the Arcade Power Block because that's what it does. It connects and distributes power to the main arcade components inside a mini arcade cabinet. In short, this PCB is a breakout for these common adjustable step-down regulators, which are very convenient for taking a 12-volt input and dropping that down to a 5-volt input for a small computer like the Raspberry Pi. Make sure to adjust the potentiometer to drop the input voltage down to the appropriate level for the Raspberry Pi. The remaining terminals connect accessories like an LCD, audio amplifier, a switch to toggle power to the cabinet, and another switch to turn the marquee backlight on or off. Popularly the terminals on the PCB is not required. You can just use this PCB to solder wires directly, but in the aid of this video I'm populating the PCB to make power connections done with screw terminals. If you use 5 volts as the only input voltage, you do not need to use the voltage regulator. You can supply 5 volts to the board and shorting the jumper here bypasses the regulator and in turn distributes power across the accessories connections. Polarity is labeled at each terminal. Adding a switch to interrupt power is simple. Just terminate each pole into this corresponding plus or minus screw terminal and the switch connection can either be shorted with just a straight jumper wire or connected directly to the bracket labeled terminal. No need to splice wires in line to control power. 
One still has to cut and strip wires to the appropriate length and solder or crimp leads from each switch and power jack connections. But again, all these are labeled and hopefully self-explanatory. Here's an overview of how I build my arcades. Connections are much simpler compared to wiring without the power block. The amplifier and LCD used in my kits have a DC jack for input power. It is important to wire with the correct polarity when using cables that can be used in more than one standard, and I'm talking about these DC pigtails. I highly recommend using a multimeter to verify which wire is the center pin, and this typically should follow the center positive standard when wiring my mini arcade cabinets. There is more than one way to connect the Raspberry Pi. You can either use a USB connection, screw terminal, or just jumper wires. They're all available on this PCB. With everything wired and working, the next step is to stuff this into the cabinet. This involves mounting the LCD with the included brackets and securing the assembly with nuts and bolts. The control panel for the LCD also needs to get mounted. This button PCB provides backlight, contrast, and input selection for the monitor. It's held in place with two machine screws. There are buttons which provide menu functions for the Raspberry Pi located underneath the marquee. Before dropping the speaker assembly into the cabinet, this is a good time to solder leads to these buttons and install the buttons underneath the marquee. Next is the audio assembly. I've already mounted the speakers and amplifier and attached the LED backlights for the marquee to the panel. The speaker assembly brackets have one bolt in each so the assembly can pivot into the cabinet like so. After the speaker bracket is installed, these are difficult to get to with the marquee in the way. The business end of this arcade is the two player controls, of which are stuffed into as little space as possible. I've already installed the joysticks with nuts and bolts. The control panel assembly is finished with the artwork layer followed by the clear acrylic panel. Arcade buttons with nylon nuts keep the stack secure. Simply put, each arcade button connects to a specific GPIO pin on the Raspberry Pi. Each button needs a signal wire and a return path to ground. Pressing the button closes the connection and the Pi senses a button press this is passed on to the software. So to keep this task of wiring 28 individual unique inputs managed and organized, I made this breakout PCB for the Raspberry Pi's GPIO header. It breaks out all 40 GPIO to screw terminals. The mounting holes line up with the Pi so the PCB can be secured to the Pi or just mounted somewhere else. The GPIO connections can be carried over with an IDE ribbon cable, which allows for easy disconnect the control panel harness. The organized part comes from knowing what goes where. Once you settled on the mapping, which I'll talk about later, I recommend making a cheat sheet with those labels. I've also removed the power pins from the header. That way, in any case I'd accidentally mirror the IDC cable, I won't short a pin. And that would be 5 volts to ground unintentionally. I only have to learn this lesson once. If wiring directly to the Pi, you can make this cheat sheet to press directly onto the pins. I don't build arcades without this cheat sheet. It cuts down on simple mistakes by a factor of a bunch. I've talked about in previous videos making these harnesses, so instead of repeating myself, I'm going to skip the point-to-point -point wiring of this control panel. It's just one button 28 times. I'm taking a shortcut here by butchering a JAMA harness. I'm harvesting the crimped ends and just cutting the wires to length. If this is your first time wiring, take your time. Um, if you've done this before, you'll understand. So a couple things happened while filming and building this arcade. The IDC cable used in the previous clip has an 80 conductor pin in a 40 pin header. I have no idea where I got this cable from. So that's not gonna work. The second cable, which I made, has 39 out of 40 working pins, so I had to scrap that one too. I ended up soldering female headers onto a different GPO breakout board, and that's going to stack on top of the Pi, which is fine because it does free up some room in the cabinet. I also rewired the breakout board upside down the second time I wired it, so yeah, I didn't enjoy rewiring this three times. The buttons I salvaged from this enormous arcade stick were also too long and interfered with the other buttons on the main control panel. So I had to replace these front control panel buttons and rewire them off camera. So when it's all wired, you can stuff all this into the cabinet and wire any remaining buttons like the volume up and down and the F1 and escape menu buttons which I locate under the marquee.
If you plan ahead and paint the correct side of the rear panel, you won't have to wire the volume buttons as the cutout on the rear matches the location of the built-in buttons on the amplifier board. But that's definitely not a mistake as I was going to wire these buttons to the front anyway. Once you're sure everything fits, it's a good idea to pick a place to mount the power block PCB so it's not loose and moving around inside. Alright, so you've already installed RetroPie, now is the time to talk about the GPIO pins and RetroGame. When I say RetroGame, I mean a small program by the folks at Adafruit. RetroGame is a small chunk of code that can be easily installed onto existing Raspberry Pi operating systems, in this case RetroPie. RetroGame allows direct wiring of the Pi's GPIO pins to be interpreted as keyboard inputs. This is great for any emulator setup with arcade controls connected to the Pi's GPIOs. Adafruit's tutorial is superior, so be sure to read that page if you want to learn more regarding how to install and advanced configuration. The new version of RetroGame lets you easily reconfigure button mappings on the fly. No need to recompile with a make file. Just make edits to the text file which is located in the boot section of the Raspberry Pi's SD card image. Plugging the SD card in your PC and editing this file with an editor like Notepad++ will allow you to reconfigure the setup best fitted for your arcade. I made my edits because I want a two-player arcade with very specific key mappings. After a bit of back and forth of testing and remapping keys, since RetroPie reserves a few keys for functions like save states, filters, reset, and so on, I made a cheat sheet that prints out to scale to match the PCB I made for this very purpose, wiring to those GPIOs. This makes point-to-point -point wiring to breeze, since all the functions are called out, I just have to match them from the back of the control panel. To verify all is working and there are no conflicts, I recommend launching a game you're familiar with that also uses all buttons possible in a two-player game. This would be a typical Capcom game, six-button fighting game. When that game loads, launch the ROM's diagnostic mode for the arcade cabinet and select the input option. Here we can check each individual input. We can also see how Capcom maps their buttons compared to other six button fighting layouts. This varies by developer, so I'm not going to worry about this because this can be reconfigured on a game by game basis within the emulator. Just note, be sure to preserve the MAME config file created after you start remapping MAME emulator keys within RetroPie. This config file will show up once you make edits in the ROM's root folder. <laughs> Hang in there, we're almost done. I've got one last tip. Chances are you're building an arcade setup similar to this. If so, you might be using analog audio output on the Raspberry Pi. Well, sometimes there's a bad feedback loop between the audio ground connection and the power and ground supplying to the audio amp. You can tell if this is the case if you hear a buzz or crackling when no sound is playing. This is usually heard at the emulation station menu. Have a listen when I turn the amp to maximum volume. The fix for this is simple and brings up the last PCB I made for mini arcade building. This is a ground loop isolator. Again, if you're using audio through the HDMI connection, you'll never run into this issue since that's digitally encoded. But the audio output of the Pi can get a bit sloppy regarding what path it takes when returning to ground in these DIY setups. Since analog audio is an AC signal, we can use a transformer to isolate it from its power source, and that's just what this tiny PCB does. The input audio goes into a small audio transformer, and it's induced on the other side, isolating it from ground reference, removing the noise. For stereo audio, we use one transformer for each channel. Have a listen to the before and after. <laughs> 
I also removed the audio from the video clip and dumped it into Audacity for another listen. I need to fix one thing before calling it done, and we did it everyone. We built the arcade. Now's the time I'll answer some frequently asked questions. First one, is this for sale? This cabinet is not for sale, but you can buy this kit and build one yourself. You'll have to paint it, wire it, and make the graphics. How much does this cost? Well, kit prices are on the website, and I'm going to leave out specifics as prices change depending on my supply chain and new tariffs that are on the way. There's a link in the description to go to the kit website. Do you sell completed or fully built kits? No. What's the size of this cabinet? In inches, it's 15 and a half inches wide by 12 inches deep by 14 and a half inches tall. Here's a basketball for reference. How much does it weigh? It's about 10 pounds or four and a half kilograms. Will you send me the artwork? No. What version of RetroPie are you running? This one's running version 4.4, .4, which is the newest release at the time of this video. What about the joysticks and buttons? The joysticks are Sanwa brand and the buttons are Suzu Hat. You can easily replace the buttons with Sanwa or Sumitsu as long as they are 28 millimeters in diameter. The TFT panel can support a resolution up to 1280 by 720. Have you heard of the Neo Geo Mini? Of course I have. I don't own one, but I think it's an interesting discussion to have regarding what SNK is doing with the Neo Geo property. I do like the concept of the Neo Geo Mini, but it's more of a shelf piece than a true homage to the Neo Geo pedigree. Honestly, I'd like to see SNK produce something with more beef or more heft. They sort of did this with the Neo Geo X, but that system flopped pretty hard as it was made by a third party manufacturer, Tomo, and I think SNK kind of lost direction on it. I would like to see SNK produce something that's a two player ready out of the box unit, as their software library is built around a two player experience. The Neo Geo X and Neo Geo Mini don't live up to the expectations many of us hold the Neo Geo brand to, hence that's why I built this arcade. Okay, well be sure to watch my other mini arcade builds if you have more questions regarding the cabinet builds, and as always, thanks for watching.